So, welcome everyone to today's business innovation seminar. And uh, today we are uh, hosted, we're hosting uh, Crosser and uh, Johan Jonsson, who is the, the co founder of a company that has been running for three years now. Offices in uh, development in Sundsvall, office in Stockholm, and very recently Munich as well. So uh, Johan has been uh, doing uh, business development uh, within the IoT sector since, uh, what did you say, 2012 maybe? And uh, yeah, doing startups since the 90s. So he has a, a lot of experience with this. So today we are going to uh, get a presentation of edge computing and why it is important for uh, future I I IoT. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you everyone, everyone here just taking the time today to drop by and, and for hopefully get some insights about edge computing and what that concept brings for the, for the future IoT. I'm just going to give you a, a quick introduction to the company. Uh, Crosser is an, we're specialized in edge computing. Uh, the source code is developed by a guy that's actually here from Sundsvall. Uh, and we have a very experienced sales team in Stockholm and recently, like we said in the introduction, have, a, have a recently opened an office in, in Munich. Um, the, the company was funded in 2016, but, but the, the how to say, the source code was, was started to be developed early 2009, which means that the core of the product has actually been developed since then, so it's kind of a stable product, even though we as a company is considered a startup early, early phase. Um, in terms of edge, I, I think we should just get a little bit of a background and a context of why edge uh, is important for IoT. And uh, the thing is that within the future, there will be so many devices, assets and things connected that the amount of data will be, well, uncontrollable. So not even getting 500 billion of devices, many of these will be cars, planes, helicopter, boats, buildings and whatever, and the total amount of data created is, is, is uh, how to say, it's too much data to, to handle. Therefore, what we need to do is actually to kind of doing a, uh, time travel, going back in time, and adopt the type of, of uh, how to say, distributed ID that we had years ago. I mean, in the 60s, the mainframe was centralized, and then we realized that we want to put out, we had these clients, the, the client server set up, and then when the infrastructure allowed and we got the smartphones, we moved back to have everything centralized in the cloud. But now, when we want to connect so many devices, once again, we have to move forward to, to, a, to a distributed setup in terms of, of computing power. In terms of the, the terminology edge, I just want to clarify that the telcos, Telia, Vodafone, Deutsche Telekom and those, for them, the edge will be the end of their network Today we're going to talk about IT edge, which means that we're going to be the edge of the local network or the industry network. So there's uh, two, the, the, how to say, the two usage of the name or, or the, the, the expression edge, but here it will be the, the, um, the IT side that we will be talking about. And the first thing that everyone's talking about is, well, edge compared to cloud, is there, is there, is there interference between cloud and edge? Or do you actually need both? Due to our opinion and what I see in the market, do you need some? <laughs> he gave me compliments about the beard, um, which is pretty. Uh, yeah. Uh, the thing is with the cloud that cloud is meant to be, as we see here, big data analytics for data at rest. We gather data, we put data into, into a cloud service. It could be also be an on-premise data center. In a data center, we store cloud, we do uh, big calculations of historian or historical data. Versus the edge is where we do the analytics from data in motion. We just look upon streaming data, and then we decide what to do with the data and either send it somewhere or just create an action out of the data and perhaps, well, move the information to the trash. 
So there's actually no interference between cloud and edge. Cloud and edge work works in, in synergy, and both things are needed. And within this presentation, I will use the terminology cloud a lot because it's pretty obvious cloud and edge together, but cloud could also be a, dat a data center could be a private cloud. You can actually have the same thinking within a private network or with, uh, inside a firewall because some, um, how to say, many of the constraints uh, within cloud versus edge will also be applied, will have the same effect uh, on the private network inside a firewall. So if the cloud is doing the big data analytics, then the, the edge will do the operational uh, analytics and very much talking about real-time and event-based actions. When something happens, we need to trigger an action. I think this is pretty obvious. The edge computing concept, well, if you only rely on the cloud, there will be some issues. One of them, the, the most obvious one and also the business driver, is that the cloud today, many of the cloud providers, the business model for them is actually, get, how to say, retrieve data and send it into their services. So just, how to say, getting the data into the cloud is actually the business model for Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and others. Which means that if you reduce the amount of data sent to your service, you will lower your costs. Sometimes you can lower the cost up to 99%. But of course, I mean, we have data scientists here. Sometimes you increase the amount of data also because maybe you do some calculations at the edge and then the, you will send even more data to the cloud. But uh, a business driver could be reduce the cloud cost. The other thing is latency. And uh, latency, for those who doesn't know, is that when you send data over a network, it takes time. It, it, it doesn't matter, it always takes time, but it could be nanoseconds or milliseconds. But in a, in a, in a setup, when you have something, how to say, on the ground, a machine or a cell phone, and you send it to a cloud service in, in, uh, that have their data center in Ireland or whatever, it will take maybe a second or two seconds to get to the data, uh, get to the data center and back. Which means that if you have, uh, let's say, an anomaly detection or, uh, algorithm, maybe you can't wait for the, uh, how to say, the, the answers or the triggers. You can't, you can't wait for one second. You need the answer. You, make it, you have to make a decision within milliseconds. Then you need to process the, the data directly and then just send the result to the storage, whatever it is. The other one is reliability. Um, connections or connectivity goes up and down. Sometimes you have a lot of bandwidth, sometimes you have less. Perhaps here in, the, in, the Scandinavia, in Scandinavia, that's not a big issue. But some countries in Europe, more countries in Africa or, or South America, they have these problems, also Middle East and, and Asia. Um, which means that sometimes they, they actually don't have any bandwidth at all, or very, very limited. So therefore you need to, to narrow it down and just send necessary data to the cloud. So you need some kind of filtering at the edge. And then lastly, we have integrations. Um, edge is a perfect environment for integrations, which means that if you want to connect one machine to another and you want to have instant reaction between the machines, in, uh, instant interaction, then uh, you have to do the integration as close to the machine as possible. It's not possible to do it in the cloud because then it will take a couple of seconds for one machine to interact with another. And that won't work in, in the process industry. So if you bundle that together, you can say that edge is somewhere between where the raw data is produced or generated and then uh, on streaming data, you do the streaming analytics. Streaming analytics could be machine learning, uh, could be some types of AI that want to have real-time data for triggering. Uh, but there's most of the use cases that we see is about cleaning and normalization because you want to prepare the data for so that when you send it for storage, the data is perfect, the data sets are okay. I will show that later. And then lastly, we have the, the how to say, the storage, or the cloud environment, uh, or data center, or whatever, where, where you want to send the result of the, the actions or the insights that you get from the edge. So the edge will be between where the data is generated and the cloud. Uh, 
I just want to create some more confusion here because <laughs> Edge, mostly Edge, will be some kind of software that's initiating communication in some way. And, the, and the which means that that software can be deployed inside a small device, like a camera. But it could be a car or a scavenger or whatever. But you will also have scenarios when, where you have like a, perhaps a gateway or a virtual machine or something that where you have the runtime environment for your, for your edge software. And then you aggregate data. In this example, it's PLCs, but it could be aggregation from a couple of sensors perhaps in a remote environment. And sometimes that's called fog computing as well. So fog computing is also, how to say, due to, to the IT side, I would say that fog is, is, is an aggregation of edge, well, edge, uh, how to say, retrievement of data. So the fog layer could also be named edge. It depends on who you talk to because it's, well, pretty much doing the same. But we also have scenarios where you use the, the edge software, you actually deploy it in the cloud as a streaming analytics because of maybe the, the, the data generator doesn't have any processing power. Maybe a, a truck like that is not a good example, but it could be, uh, I know <coughs> a lot of en environmental projects where you have sensors uh, perhaps in, in, in rivers and, and within lakes to understand the, the pH level of something and just sending one signal of data, then you don't have to filter it, but you need something to, to receive it and process it and perhaps deliver insights in real time. And then you can have this software, the edge software running in the cloud. So as you can see, edge, the, edge, um, the edge solution or the edge software can actually be run in, in different places depending on the, uh, of the need of the, of, the of the use case, depending on the scenario. So, we as a company, we focus on, on industry, which means that most of the examples that I will take will be fr within industries. Uh, there will be a lot of machines, there will be a lot of, how to say, high-speed communication between machines and so forth. And, um, there are a lot of challenges out there. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I would say that for the last 18 months, me and my team had about 200 uh, business meetings with different groups, organizations, and enterprises from all over the world. And there are some things that come up over these meetings. And one of them that is very, very, very obvious is that data coming from industrial machines are not in order. It could, be, it could be a very specialized PLC from Siemens that have a proprietary protocol sending. It could be a Modbus protocol. It could be some, some other sensor stack that's sending sensor. And this, this, the information, the input stream, perhaps seems a line in the first, but when you look deeper into it, you see that uh, one sensor is sending by a second, another one is sending within milliseconds. But for you to, to gain insight out of that data stream, you need to align the data so you have the same timestamp, the same formats, or whatever you need to apply the type of analytics that you want to. It doesn't matter if you want to do the analytics at the edge or you just want to store the data, you need to prepare it. And that's a big problem out there because there are so many struggles because uh, one machine, I mean, we have representatives here from the industry that I know that, I mean, they have machines out there that on one location, they have a Siemens, um, machine executing system or runtime environment for the processing. But then on the other hand, they can have ABB on another site. And on the third one, they have their own, which means that for them to connect all the data, it will be a, a pretty complicated setup. In these scenarios, Edge could be a perfect environment to prepare the data for the further work of, of the, the IoT pyramid. So. <coughs> when you go two years ago, when you went to conferences, everyone was talking about AI and deep learning. Today, I would say that most of the conferences, they talk about how to collect the data and how to well, aggregate, put the right labels. How do you order the data so that you get perfect data sets for the analytics they want to do further on in the, in, in the pipeline? Uh, because without the data, well, the whole I IoT ID is kind of worthless. Um, so, a lot of the things that we see do is just from the bottom of the pyramid. You collect the data, um, 
you align it, uh, perhaps you aggregate, uh, you, you apply some kind of analytics or, or some kind of um, functionality that you need for instant actions or perhaps, well, just slower actions or integrations from to, to other um, systems or services. Um, if you just drill down inside an edge software, uh, we try we as a company try to illustrate it like this: that the edge software is is running in a runtime environment. It could either get <coughs> data from a producer, but it could also listen or, or retrieve data from a process somewhere. So this software needs to both be how to say subscriber to information, but also just retrieving information without being a subscriber. And the data that comes in could be, I mean, for you that's familiar with industry terms, uh, OPC is a very, very common protocol for, for, for industry data. Um, MQTTs have been more of a, how to say, uh, industry standard of sending data to the cloud. So all the cloud providers more or less require, inter not requires, but they prefer getting MQTT to as a protocol for, for, for the storage or sending to the IoT services. But still, so on this side, you have something that's generating data. Within an edge software, what you do is that you first you monitor the data to see what kind of data is it, what, what do we need to do. Then you do some, some kind of functionality, you apply functionality, um, and that could be like filtering, aggregation, uh, put some ex uh, extra metadata or whatever, just make sure that the data is, is, is good, but it could be a Python model that uh, some kind of anomaly detection or, well, th the use cases are hundreds, thousands. But then the thing is with, with the edge layer is that, or the edge software, is that you also take action because the edge software is a communication server, it's a communication software that could actually initiate communication, which means that from that point, you also integrate the data. It could be to a file storage or a database, but it could also generate via some service, uh, generate a text message to someone's cell phone. Or it could be actually just sent to trash if, well, not needed. Or perhaps apply some other functionality or actions that you need for that specific use case. Um, so, Without this being kind of a sales meeting, I just wanted to show you how we approached all these problems. And then I'm going to move over to, to the customer examples and the use cases that we learned. But just to give you a an, an brief introduction. The cross the solution, we, we have we are looked upon this on from two angles. One is that you need a runtime environment or a software that's uh, deployed really close to the machine or what assets that's producing the data. And within that, we need to process data really, really fast, near re real time, within, let's say, 40 to 50 milliseconds, something like that, depending on what kind of hardware you have. But we also have seen that when you get this, I mean, IoT is not, like we said at the beginning of the presentation, IoT is not about one installation. It's about thousands of installations, which means that with all the complexity that the industry have, it's very difficult just to get the same type of, of software uh, how to say, deployed in, in different locations. So what you need is that you need some kind of <coughs> platform. In our, in our solution, it's a cloud platform that can remotely distribute uh, this uh, software out to different locations. So from one central location, you can work with your uh, with the data flow that you want to use for that specific use case and then remotely insert it into the machine or the asset that needs the type of calculation or, or processing that, that, that you're looking for. So our solution is, maybe it should be the opposite sizes, so that, that this one is very small and that one is very big. But so so the, the cloud the cloud part is one thing and then this small software is another thing. And we this small software is always between the data and Maybe it's a cloud or a data center. The cloud that we have <coughs> is where we let the, our customers by themselves design the data flows that they need. So what th they have an environment where they design, uh, how to say, 
uh, what type of protocol do I want to use, what kind of functionality wanna do I want to apply, and also what type of integrations do I want to apply to that. And within this cloud environment, you test it. So what you can do is you can make sure that it really works. You can use a data generator that we provide so that you can have the, the type of data sets that, that, you, that you want, but you can also connect to a machine somewhere and get <coughs> uh, say authentic data sets into the, the, to the data flow and make sure that everything is working. And when you have done the tests in the cloud, you just send control data down to the node. We call it the node or this edge software. Uh, make an update, and then the software itself will, in runtime, just recompile and then start doing the type of data flow that, that you want to for that specific use case. The node typically is running behind a firewall because we mostly meet factories, which means that <coughs> uh, there are no data sent. F oh, sorry. Uh, there are no data sent. F uh, how to say the process data is not sent from the from the edge node to the cloud because we know that by integrity and security, and also by um, due to confide confidentiality, we don't we never see the data. We we, we know that this the, the node itself or the software only has to process data and send it within the network, not to a third party like us, because companies doesn't like that. And inside the firewall, the node is connected to all these kind of different data sources, machines, systems, historians, whatever. But also, we're almost in this almost every scenario, we're connected so to some kind of on-premise service or a data center for, for that specific factory or plant. So, but as you can see, if the, the, if the company are using a cloud provider, we also integrate from the cloud provider directly out to their machines. Here in, in, in Sweden, we have a great example of that, could be SCA, where they have, you, have, you have the pulp and paper mills, but you also have harvesters and, and other machines are in the field, but you need the data from both sides and aggregate it to get the right type of, of um, uh, insights that you need for that specific reason. The last part, and this is kind of the differentiator, I would say, between us as a company and all the other companies out there, is that we think that IoT shouldn't only be for programmers. We think that IoT is, is bridging the IT department, the innovation department, and especially the engineers that actually design the machines. Because the <coughs> engineers, they will know, they always know, how the machine should work in the best way. They know the anomaly detection, they know the, the models from whatever type of service you use for doing modeling of the machine. Um, so what we wanted to do is that we want to change the idea about IoT to make it easier for non-programmers to actually implement the type of data flows that you need. So implementing a model today, you don't need to be a programmer. As long as you are, how to say, if you, if you can design the model in a, in a local way and, and test it, then it, you should be able to do, do it without writing code to send the data model down to the machine. So for that, we are, in our service, we have a flow-based programming setup where you actually have pre-built modules that you drag and drop, you can connect them, and you configure them instead of writing code. But if you are a programmer, of course you can do this with code as well. We have co code modules, and we even have a what we call a universal connector, where you can actually design modules yourself without writing code, and then you can compile them, and then you can reuse them in within your organization as much as you want for, for, for REST, uh, REST APIs. So this flow-based uh, pro uh, flow, uh, program is kind of it's a big part of the concept with our solution to just bridge the gap between automation, IT, and the engineers that are building the machine. Okay. <coughs> like I said, uh, we meet a lot of industries. We have been focusing on Europe. We uh, actually our, our how say dedicated focus is the Dutch region with Germany, Austria, and, and Switzerland. Um, and um, I will give you some of the examples that we have seen over uh, over the last two years in terms of what problems they have and how you can address this and how they address this, uh, these problems. Um, within, a, within the process industry, we have seen that the management level, they have difficulty, difficult, difficulties with the, with the learning curve. 
if they apply a new solution or a platform for the service, they need to get it up and running fast. And they, they, it's very important that their their employees or the resources that they are that they have can start working with it as soon as possible. <coughs> The second one is the cost of life cycle. There are so many hidden costs within software that the huge organizations out there, the enterprises and the big groups, they are a little bit terrified about of getting new software into the system because they know that sometimes the cost of the software can be multiplied up to 10 times over the years just because of the work to maintain and do upgrades and version control and so forth. Um, what we also see is that the, um, the skill level or, or the knowledge about uh, the technical side of IoT is pretty low within the industry because they are focused on their main problem, which is the machine, not data communication. And so that's, that's logical. They, they are very special. So they don't have the resources. They don't have so many data scientists. They don't have so many developers. So, and the really skilled one that they, are, th that they have, they are locked in, in other projects which are very important also. Uh, so they actually have they kind of have a gap to, to build the project group or, or build the, the to have the right setup for, for large how to say rollouts and, and scale up of, of their uh, IoT investments. On a technical side, <coughs> there is a big problem. There are so many legacy machines out there. I mean that, but that's not a problem. I, I mean, it's not a problem for the business because the business is great. They have been selling the same machine and it's been working accordingly for 15, 20, 30 years, which is great. That's great for all, all economies. But in terms of protocol and, and data communication, it could be a struggle because it will be more difficult to get in contact with that machine. Also, networks. Um, there are no, fa no plants out there that are exactly the same because the groups, they acquire new plants. They buy a new factory over there, they buy a new factory over there, and they get stuck with different systems and different setups. Perhaps different setups to connect to a machine using different protocols, different security setups. Everything is different between the, the, the factories and plants, even within Sweden. So we think that we are far ahead, but the, same, the problem is the same everywhere. Um, and that's also the fragmented system, legacy protocol. Another big issue is that for the industry is that the data coming out from from a plant, uh, they call the industry call it tags or, or just one sensor data could be a tag. There are so many. I mean, from from a paper mill, it could be like 25 up to 30,000 tags if you look upon the whole service, even more sometimes. Uh, then how do you retrieve the 15? that that specific use case need. And how do you make sure that within, if you send data from a service to, to let's say a vendor that's wanna, or a supplier that's wanna check their machine or, or utilize a predictive maintenance program, how do you make sure that they get the exact data that they need and not the competitor's data? Because within the factory, you have different suppliers and they are very scared of sending their information to a competitor because then they can optimize their machine and oh well, the competitive uh, advantages will disappear. So the industry is struggling with getting the right data out to the right receiver. And then integrations. Um, it's very today, um, the automation companies out there, Siemens, ABB, Beckhoff, BNR, all the big ones, they have over the years created silos in terms of information. So if you have a Siemens system here and an ABB system here, you have difficulties to make them talk to each other. So what you need is you need some kind of layer that could bridge the gap between different machines. Perhaps that's a Siemens and that's an ABB and that's from someone else. You need something, you need a layer that bridges that communication. What you also need is you need a layer, which is the edge layer, that can communicate from the machine execution system to the machines, perhaps send data to a historian and do all the kind of integrations needed from the machines and upwards. Um, this can be done today within, let's say, many of the, the historian um, softwares, they have integration, integration uh, abilities. But the problem is that you can't send code from the outside and in, uh, and they are not meant to, to, to deal with data in real time. And they are not being an environment to host, let's say, Python models for the anomaly detection, which means that this layer opens up for the industry to do all the things, do the advanced analytics, machine-to-machine -machine communication, 
it opens up for, for as a runtime environment for AI and machine learning and all these type of predictive maintenance programs that you see out there. There's, there are a lot of companies that, that are doing a great job in analyzing why and when a machine might break, but how do they get the algorithm out there? If you're seated here in Sundsvall doing a perfect or a very good algorithm, how do you get it to Brazil? And how do, you how do you maintain it over the years? How do you do the updates? And how do you make sure that the algorithm is running all the time? You never know, because you will get a, an email two days after when something happens. So what you, do, you, you need that information in real time. And this edge la layer can provide that today. <coughs> but that's not it. The thing is that the industry today they want to have this integration layer. They want to have it, how to say, seamlessly into the supplier's side. Because to make the factory work, they need information about pre-production, about the supply chain. But also, on the other hand, they want to have information about how do our, our, our um, the products that we're producing, how, do, how do, does it, how does, how to say, the transport, is that, is that working accordingly? And, is the and when it arrives to the customer, is it arriving at the, si the right time? Do we have any complaints? And uh, is the quality okay? And so I have example of industries here in Sweden that's producing great products over here, top premium products, and then, then send them all the way to China. And the, and the receiver in China says, well, no, 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 this quality is not good enough because something happened during the, the transport. And then just wanna, they just want some kind of refund of the pricing. And then the factory itself has no idea what's happened here because they have no control of what's happening in this, uh, during the transport. If they had, they could say to the, to the customer, hey, we send you, perfect, we send you a perfect, piece, uh, perfect product, the quality was perfect, and nothing happened during the, pro the, during the transport. So therefore, you, you, we will not give you a refund. Now they're just, it takes a lot of effort and it costs a lot of money to actually see who's right in this, this specific case. So if you have an edge layer uh, that can process data and integrate data and also remotely access data within other companies' networks in a secure way, then you can actually have this, how to say, perfect setup for the IoT enablement for industries. Industries need, they need just, just, just a server conducting data about the status of the delivery or the production. Perhaps you use the same, you can have the same platform for machine to machine communication and everything can be, uh, how to say, distributed and managed in the same place. No matter if you have one plant or 100 plant. And you can make the information, uh, how to say, um, flow seamlessly between all the elements in, in the value chain of your factory. Okay, lastly, uh, <coughs> I would like to show you some of the use cases that we have seen. Uh, and we have also, I picked out, well, I shouldn't say I, me and my team, I mean, I have great guys there. We have picked out the, the 10 most common use cases that we have seen, and I will try to explain them. Um, the first thing that we see is actually just send the data. I'll, how do you say? Just collect data in any form, prepare it by some, well, in a simple way, and also make sure that the data always reaches the destination, so you don't get any gaps in the data sets that you send to the cloud. That's, that's I would say that that is the most common use case. Another one that is, is getting more and more um, I would say that maybe that's that I think it's a very easy use case. It's easy to start with. It's it's a how to say it's an entry point for for industrial IoT. It's using cameras for vision based inspections. Let's say that you have a machine running. It's very easy and cheap to set up a camera on the existing network. It's very easy to to find a good uh, how to say it's it's a very easy setup to do. And then you can do the anomaly detection of of the, of the production. And then by I would say integrate the inf information either to the next machine or to an operator or just send the report to someone. So it's a very e it's a starting ground in, in many cases. And today we're doing, we have, we have one huge customer 
that are right now deploying to 55 factories. They are they're deploying their Python models directly out to the machines, doing anomaly detection within milliseconds, controlling the next machine in the same process line so that the, the machines align. So when if the first machine is doing something wrong, then the, the second machine will align to that to the difference and make sure that you don't have any waste or less waste. Um, so that's one use case. Another one that we have seen, I haven't seen this. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, proof of concepts regarding this. Uh, I haven't seen any rollouts yet, but they will come. And there are vision fe fencing. Uh, so uh, within industries, you have a camera that's well, overviewing a machine. And then the camera can see if there's, if there's a person within a specific area. Perhaps you should lower the, the speed of the machine to maintain high security level. Or if there are two people in there, and they're not moving, perhaps you should just stop the machine, something like that. Um, and this is something also that many of the, the big ones, I know that Intel has a, has a big pro uh, project regarding this because um, this sometimes requires really high how to say, processing of the imaging. Uh, so it's, it's, um, we are actually doing a, a demo set with them um, within a big exhibition regarding just that getting um, getting image data process it really fast and then take action the fourth one is something that i told you in the beginning that's cloud cost reduction what we see is that many use cases don't need the iot setup of their cloud provider microsoft has it amazon has it google has it not in the directly the same way alibaba has it where, where they have an iot solution that the customer buy and then they charge you for the amount of data passing through that service. But if you just want to send data to storage in cloud, then you don't need the IoT service for that specific use case. So therefore, using edge environment, you can integrate the data directly to storage, and then you reduce the, the, co the cost of the service by up to 99%, which is really good. Uh, so that is also a very big enabler of IoT pilots because if you can reduce the costs then of course the industry will go faster to market with with um, with id um, we also see a lot of factory floor integration uh, like i said one machine that's doing something and the, the the plant owner want to connect that information to the next one perhaps apply some kind of predictive maintenance model or something to make sure that these machines are running accordingly sending data back and forth and Mostly in this time, it has to be event-based and it has to be really, really fast. Um, um, so, so that is, and I would say that I would say that all the use cases that I know of is between machines that have different, how to say, st uh, steering system or operating system, so that you have like a Siemens product or an ABB product or whatever. So they have to communicate between each other. This one, I would say, is has come up one year ago. No one asked us about this. Everyone thought about well, the deployment. The, it wasn't even in a, it wasn't a, a question even in the meetings. Today, everyone is wondering. Okay, we want to do machine learning. We have great models. We have have a great structure for for the data. Uh, we know how the machines should behave. But how do we get the code out there? So we have customers today coming to us just for the purpose of distributing the models that they want to run, mostly within Python, but it could be C-sharp models and whatever. But, but it's, it's, it's very easy to do it in a, in a local environment. But then how do you scale? How do you get it out to, to 800 machines or 50 machines spread it out of 50 countries? Uh, so I think that to make edge work, you need in within your strategy for the edge deploy. You need an edge deployment strategy as well. Not only thinking that that will you we can use the VPN tunnel that we used before because that will take too long. Uh, you wouldn't be able to connect to the other factory, sit down, decide a time, get the VPN up and running, and then get the, the code down there. You need some other type of setup to make the, to make this work over time. Um, another very common use case is remote condition monitoring. That is, uh, I mean, we have uh, there are a lot of um, 
they want to make sure that the pump is running accordingly. They want to just get the data from something that's that's um, how was it, remote located. We have a uh, we're working with a oil field in Texas where they want to check upon the, the health of, of uh, pumps that are down in, in really deep holes with a lot of water. Uh, and they have difficulties to know whether this pump is running in the best way or if it's, ha if it's sending uh, error codes, what type of error codes. So they, they have to go back and forth out on the oil field and ha manually check the pumps, for instance. That, that, that so just remotely look upon machines is something that's growing. Um, the problem often is that the machine doesn't have connectivity. So the first step is to apply connectivity and then apply some kind of processing. We also see some examples coming up about perhaps you have just a few moving components. You have a small system and then you don't need a big MES system to run it. You just want like you, you need a software to control a couple of PLCs, nothing more than that. Um, so we get some requests regarding having what they say MES system light. Very, very easy system, conducting data from PLCs, perhaps sending data back, sending data from one PLC to another, well, making that communication work so that the machine, a small machine, can work accordingly. That could be run with inside a Raspberry Pi for, 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 for simple usage. Um, we don't see this as much in Europe. This is, I would say, is, is mostly actually from Asia, uh, India. Uh, I see a lot of these examples where they want to run smaller, um, how to say, uh, assets this way. Um, why I think that is so, why I think that is growing is because it's very easy to, to let's say, deploy a gateway, and then you can run a software in, inside that gateway and use that as the MES system for all the PLCs, so it's very easy setup to do. You have a lot of PLCs, you, you have the gateway, the interfaces, and then just send the data back and forth. So it's, I think it's a fast way to get to market with a product. Um, <coughs> this one is very common. We see it all the time, and that's what I told you earlier about this tag separation. Make sure that that supplier get their tags and no one else. Make sure that that, that um, machine manufacturer over there only get the 25 tags they are obliged to, nothing more than that. Um, and make that very smoothly and easy. And also over time, if the companies, if they grow, they perhaps they buy another machine or they work within another process area, they need more, how say, more tags. It has to be in an environment that is very easy to, to, to make sure that the right tags are, are, are sent. And then what we see is that um, uh, the industry uh, used the terminology message broker earlier. They were, c they were using to, to get the information from the machines and send it into the, the, the well, integrated into the IT world or beside of the automation world. They were using open source message brokers. Um, and what we see is that they nowadays they are replacing the, these small in integration with edge with the edge softwares instead because an edge software can do a lot more than just send the data a message broker is more or less taking some kind of data and then make sure that it runs well you just send it some just like the name of it the message broker to just make sure that the publisher somewhere get or sorry a subscriber somewhere get the data that this publisher is actually publishing but an edge um, software in the same position could do a lot more than just be a broker of the data. So these are the most common ones. And as you can see, there aren't so many AI yet. Because I think that today, mostly when people, when, peop when you really dig into the project, AIs are mostly pox and pilots. People sometimes are mistaken and, and they use the terminology AI for machine learning or like ML code. So it's, I would say that we don't see so many AI projects yet. We, we, we are, we are, how say, we are working with a couple of AI um, specialists and we are doing some proof of concepts and tests and pilot, but we haven't seen so many full rollouts yet of that. But we see a lot of machine learning. That's something that's just coming a lot. Okay, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this.
you on. Um, before the questions, uh, I would just like to say that the next seminar will be on November 7th, where we will have uh, Mette Olsson from Baby. So uh, mark your calendar for that one. Um, for the first time now, we have had a uh, menti.com link up, so the ones that are watching the live stream uh, can also uh, ask questions to you on. So, do we have a question there? Okay, so I guess uh, the question is, um, is, the, um, in, is the industry mature enough, let's say, in order to formulate good cases to you at Crosser? Um, uh, yes, I would say yes. They weren't one year ago because they haven't figured it out. They didn't have the, 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 the resources. But today, yes. Um, there are s there are um, the, the companies and the industries that we meet, they have realized that they need a special group with really skilled engineers that actually, how to say, take lead in these projects. And today they are very good at, how to say, boxing or, or, or scooping the, the case so that you know what to do. Uh, and they are, they are well, well, these groups are also well educated, so they know about the, the problems from proof of concept to full production. So, yeah. So we only had the one question on Mente this time, but uh, it's a good start, I guess. So uh, we will uh, uh, try to continue with this. Yeah. Um, any questions from the audience here? Bosse. Uh, 